get started then. So today uh, it won't be a blackboard uh, lecture, uh, but I mean, if necessary, I will use the blackboard to show you some new ideas, but it will mostly be like a review of what we have seen so far in this uh, last four days, and three days actually. So um, these slides will be kind of including uh, some old terminology and also some new ideas that I haven't shown you, uh, I haven't showed you before. So uh, the title is Mark Alexander Polynomial. So uh, we have defined the Alexander Polynomial in the original with the original construction and also with the state sum description yesterday. And uh, today I will show you that we can define Alexander polynomial like polynomials for some variations of knots, such as uh, virtual knots that are knots lying in uh, thickened surfaces, um, or for notoids that are open-ended uh, knots lying in some surfaces. So um, this, I mean, this presentation includes some works uh, that uh, we did with Louis Kaufman also. Uh, with Walt Mopbaker and uh, Joe Monaghan uh, from University of Amsterdam. And before starting my talk, I would love to thank to this uh, fellowship. I was supported by Simpi CTP Research in Pairs uh, fellowship, and uh, this is why I'm here. And uh, with my collaborators, Joe and Walt, we were here all together last week. Now they are back in Amsterdam. I was saying that we know uh, now whether or not is whether or not uh, in three-dimensional space, Euclidean spaces, and uh, the main problem of knot theory is to classify knots up to mb in the isotopy. Okay, and I just showed you that this mb in the isotopy relation can be captured by three Rydermeister moves uh, in the plane, um, and we call them Rydermeister one, two, three. And we can, uh, by the Rydermeister theorem, we can work knots through their diagrams in the plane. Uh, we have many invariants defined for knots uh, using uh, planar representations of them. So uh, I just mentioned, uh, I just said that there are also virtual knots. These are knots that are embedded in some uh, genus G surface with a thickening. So we just uh, take a surface of genus G and we uh, thicken it with the unit interval so that uh, our knots can be embedded into this three-dimensional manifold. Uh, so here we see a Kishino knot uh, in genus 2 surface. I mean, uh, we can regard it as the representation of the uh, knot. We can regard it as the surface diagram of the knot embedded in genus 2 surface, thick uh, genus 2 surface. And here there are some passages, right? I mean, uh, along the handles, uh, we see that some curves are turning around and. Uh, around the genuses, uh, we see some parts are going around, right? So a virtual knot is uh, defined as an embedding of the unit circle in a thickened surface. And when we uh, want to study uh, virtual knots in the plane, we have these non-planar representations that we see uh, here. There are two uh, different new type of crossings coming along. So here is a representation of the uh, surface diagram that we have here. So we have classical crossings that I show with the breaks here. It's, they are really like uh, intersections in the surface diagram. And in the uh, three manifold, they are not really intersecting, but in the representation when we project uh, these strands at this point, we see these double intersections. But we show them uh, in the crossing uh, with the crossing information, right? I mean, we want to know which strand is going and uh, which strand is going under this transversal intersection. But we have these different types of uh, crossings as well that we represent these passages here along the handle, right? I mean, some uh, of the strands here, some part of the strands are going just uh, you know uh, behind the handle, so they are not really intersections in the surface. They are not crossings in the surface, but when we want to represent what's going on in the torus here, genus 2 surface, we need to include these two information, uh, the crossing information. So we call these two types of uh, crossings virtual crossings, and um, 
you can think of this uh, diagram here, this planar representation of a virtual knot as a non-planar graph, right? I mean, if you consider crossings, classical crossings, as four valent vertices, uh, virtual crossings are can be regarded as uh, non uh, as just intersections of edges, but they are uh, intersecting at uh, points that are not vertices, right? So. Uh, this theory of virtual knots uh, was introduced by Louis Kaufman in 1999 uh, and we have many invariants for them. We have also some other variants of uh, knots such as uh, notoids. notoids uh, the theory of notoids was introduced by Tribe uh, in 2012, uh, pretty recently, and we can define a notoid as an open-ended knot diagram in a surface. Uh, here in the picture, it's in the plane, or you can consider it in the two uh, sphere or uh, some torus. Um, so, mathematically, we call an immersion, a generic immersion of the unit interval uh, into some two dimensional manifold, uh, a notoid. So, here, when we consider knot diagrams, I mean, uh, up to this point, we consider knots as embeddings of the uh, unit circle, right, in three-dimensional space or immersions of the unit circle in the plane or uh, in the two-sphere. But here we see uh, immersions of the unit interval, right? So we have openants here uh, in this picture. There are two openants of a notoid diagram. And then it's time to ask, but can't we just uh, undo this uh, crossings here by just pulling endpoints over or under um, some other strands, right? If we allow pulling or pushing the endpoints, we can just undo an open string, actually. Uh, it's uh, really uh, easy to uh, have an experiment with a piece of string. But uh, to have a non-trivial theory, we forbid two moves. Uh, this moves here on the right, so we forbid to pull an endpoint over or under uh, or push it uh, over or under a transversal strand. So when we forbid these two moves and when we just allow the Rydomeister moves, classical Rydomeister moves happening, taking place away from the endpoints, we have the theory of notoids in some surface, in the plane, in the two sphere or uh, in some genus surface. Uh, all these theories are maybe different from each other. And in this talk, we will mostly think about uh, notoids in the plane and in the two sphere. Okay, so when we consider notoids in the two sphere uh, in S2, uh, actually, there is this endpoint uh, existence uh, for a notoid diagram. There are two endpoints, and they can lie in the same phase or in the same region uh, determined by the diagram uh, in the two sphere is in the first picture here, okay? So in this case, we can regard this diagram as a one, one tangle. So when we connect the endpoints, we see that there will be no crossings created and it closes up to a trefoil, right? And the topological information that these two objects carry uh, are the same, all right? So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between not type notoids or uh, notoids that admit at, at least one diagram with endpoints in the same region and uh, classical knots, knots in the, or not diagrams in the sphere or knots in the three-dimensional space. But the theory also, notoid theory also uh, contain or include diagrams with endpoints in different regions, okay? So there may be some notoids uh, no matter which representation that you look uh, at, the endpoints may not be or cannot be brought to the same region by Rydomeister moves. So this is uh, one example of a proper notoid. Uh, we will know that by using some invariants of notoids that no matter what deformation you make by a sequence of, uh, by any sequence of Rydomeister moves, you cannot bring the endpoints in the same region. So here in the middle we see another diagram and here uh, it's another uh, diagram of a proper notoid diagram. So the question here is really like if we can find a sequence of Rydomeister moves to bring the endpoints into the same region. So this is called the height problem of notoids. So the height of a notoid is the distance, crossing distance between the endpoints. So here in the first picture 
or from the pictures we can see the minimum number of crossings that we need to add through a closure. For example, if we just uh, want to close the diagram with an underpassing strand, it is clear that we need to add one more crossing to the diagram, right? To complete it, to close it to a trefoil. So for this diagram, it is one, the height of this diagram. But the question is if we can reduce it to zero, if it's a knot type knotoid. So again, I mean, uh, it's like a it's one of the classification problems uh, of knotoid theory. And it is again uh, very direct or easy, straightforward to ask, but hard to calculate the knotoid. You need to see all kinds of representations of a knotoid to be able to say the exact number, the minimum number of crossings that you need to add to the diagram representation for a notoid uh, to close that diagram. So we may extend uh, notoids to linkoids. Linkoids uh, are uh, just, you know, uh, like links. Uh, they may have some, um, they may contain some circular components or not components, like here, uh, or uh, they may have a finite number of uh, notoid components. So it is, uh, we can call, uh, we can define a linkoid as a union of some number of notoidal components and uh, circular components or not components. So the theory extends to linkoids. All right, so um, I won't go into uh, very much of uh, notoid theory, but I need to say that uh, the theory of notoids in the plane, especially in the plane, uh, has found some important applications in the topological analysis of proteins. So here uh, it's the cartoon uh, description of some particular uh, protein in the picture on the left hand side and on the right we see some uh, uh, simplification of this cartoon picture. Uh, so if you look at this picture carefully there is this red uh, string uh, or space curve or in our cells whatever in a compact space uh, that has two endpoints black endpoints right. So we can just exhibit two parallel lines and the plane that is perpendicular to these two parallel lines and we can take the projection of this protein uh, chain uh, to the plane, right? And the direct uh, projection, a perpendicular projection of this chain to the, di uh, to the plane is a notoid diagram. Another way to understand uh, this protein chain is to uh, exhibit a closure in the three-dimensional space to connect the two endpoints of this chain and then project it to the plane and then the projection will be a knot diagram, right? So to understand the topology uh, of this protein, we can study either notoids or knots. But notoids have shown us that uh, they give a more uh, refined uh, understanding uh, of proteins because during the closure it may be the case that we can lose the nothingness of the protein. So here maybe I have an example but I mean I will explain it uh, in a simple way. Just a second. I need to have a chalk. So suppose that your protein chain is simplified to this picture and you exhibit a closure, that is, we want to connect the endpoints with an uh, arc, with a simple arc, so that the arc goes over, right? So you see the closed object is a knot diagram, but it's actually uh, equivalent to on knot, right? We have this Rydermeister 2 move available here that will undo this uh, diagram. So. Of course, this is like a very simplification of what's going on here. I mean, what I say to you, but during closures, uh, if we just, uh, you know, try to understand protein chains with knot models or uh, mod modeling them with knots, we can lose some information, not this information. But if we just directly uh, exhibit uh, two parallel lines and make this line uh, projection uh, to the plane, and if we try to understand this uh, configuration here, through notoids, we can capture the non-trivial notoidness information by using notoid uh, invariants. Okay, so I mean, uh, I can just uh, 
refer to a paper that we have written uh, all together by uh, some colleagues, uh, Gunnar Luis and uh, some other people. Uh, so uh, you can have a look at this paper titled Topological Models uh, for Open-Ended Protein Chains Using the Concept of Notoids and Bonded Notoids. And in this paper, uh, we exhibited like uh, convincingly many uh, projection directions for a given protein chain. And we have looked at the dominant type of uh, notoids that we have uh, in the plates, because uh, there is not just a unique uh, projection direction, right? I mean, you can project the protein chain um, through different directions. And in every uh, projection, uh, you may have different types of notoids. So the idea was to uh, understand or verify the dominant type uh, through these projections. And to understand the dominant type, we have uh, utilized uh, notoid invariants such as the loop uh, bracket polynomial uh, or the arrow polynomial. Arrow polynomial is actually, I haven't uh, showed it to you, but it's a um, um, generalization of the Jones polynomial. Uh, it utilizes the same or very similar idea uh, that we use for the construction of the bracket polynomial, actually. So if we consider a crossing, what we have done for the bracket polynomial was uh, to smooth out this crossing in two possible ways, right? I mean, there's exactly two possible ways to delete this crossing in the vertical or horizontal way or in the A or B type way. And uh, we connected the free ends then uh, afterwards, right, after the deletion. So in the arrow polynomial uh, construction, we consider oriented diagrams, unlike the case of the bracket polynomial. So still, we exhibit uh, two kinds, uh, two types of smoothings here. So I just determine the A type of regions, and here are the B type of regions. Okay, so what we have is, if we smooth uh, this crossing in the A way, we have this configuration. Right. And if we smooth the crossing in another way, we have B times this configuration, right? So here, when we start with our uh, start smoothing out uh, our diagram, uh, I said that we assume orientation on the diagram, or we don't ignore it if there is an orientation. So when we don't ignore the orientation, we see one of these smoothings are, uh, is non-orientable or disoriented. Let's see which one. So if we smooth uh, this crossing in the vertical way, we see that we just delete this crossing here and we want to connect the endpoints, the resulting endpoints in the vertical way and the orientations are compatible on the strands, right? So the vertical smoothing or the B smoothing is the oriented smoothing here. But the A smoothing results a configuration like this, right? So you see, we can keep this information still. We can extract some information out of this uh, disoriented smoothing. We don't want to delete or kill this term. We just add some cusps here because uh, it looks like a cusp, right? I mean, some disoriented uh, structure we have. And uh, they are paired. So we see a pair of cusps here resulting from the disoriented smoothing. So when you start smoothing out a given uh, oriented notoid diagram or a knot diagram, uh, or even a virtual knot diagram, uh, you will see these cusp-like structures uh, in some uh, open components. And we will assign some new uh, variables for these uh, structures. So let me show you an example. So here is, if I want to smooth this in the A way, B way, let's see what we have. Okay, so, and the other smoothing gives us a pair of cusps. So we keep this information here. Okay, I continue smoothing the resulting uh, diagrams in two ways. 
And you will see in the end that we will have a number of circles in the plane and exactly one component that is open that will contain the endpoints, right? And you may show that, uh, I mean, it's a, um, you can take it as an exercise that there can be cusps uh, on the circular components, but they will cancel out in the end because we uh, assume some reduction rules. So if the cusps are looking like this, which means that, I mean, we assume that this uh, sequential uh, cusps lying in some component that is resulted uh, from some smoothing of the diagram. And here, locally, we see two sides of the cusps, right? I mean, the inside of the cusp and outside of the cusp. I can name these two sides, okay? Or you can call the inside as the side of the acute angle here, right? So if the inside of a sequential uh, two um, cusps are in the same side, like here, then we just assume that this is the trivial strand. Okay, we just uh, cancel this pair of cusps in this case. But it may be looking like a pair of cusps on the same component, looking like a, a zigzag. All right, so it continues like this. So here are the orientations. So you see here, inside of this cusp is a, um, on this side, and inside of this cusp lies in the uh, other side, um, if we see this picture locally, right? So we want to keep this uh, type of cusps uh, on the components. So it gives us a new information, an ex additional information for notoid diagrams. As I said in the beginning, I mean, we can uh, apply or we can define the arrow polynomial for classical knot diagrams as well. But by some simple argument coming from the Jordan curve theorem, we can show that um, cusps are eliminated by the reduction rule. So it turns out to be the Jones polynomial. I mean, it determines the Jones polynomial in the end by some normalization. So it's uh, not giving something new for the classical case, but for a notoid case, we may have some cusps lying on open components with endpoints. So we uh, assign new variable, um, an additional variable uh, to the bracket polynomial to uh, get the arrow polynomial for notoids. So this was very uh, useful actually to understand proteins as well. Uh, we utilize this polynomial and uh, there's another variation of the bracket polynomial called the loop polynomial. We also use that, but I'm not going very deep inside this subject. Um, sorry. Okay, so yesterday we talked about the Alexander polynomial. Uh, we talked about the classical construction of the Alexander polynomial. Uh, here is a review for that. Uh, we were just uh, assigning some local weight system around each crossing and we were extracting, we extract some uh, system of linear equations, which we um, represent by n by uh, n plus two matrix. And then uh, the idea was to delete two adjacent columns from this uh, matrix and to have a square matrix, a reduced uh, square matrix. And then we see the determinant uh, of this resulting matrix to have the Alexander polynomial. But it was up to our uh, choices here, how we enumerated the regions and the vertices and also uh, which adjacent columns are chosen here to, do, to be deleted, right? So the Alexander polynomial is defined up to some uh, term here, plus minus x to the n, uh, some integer powers of x. So uh, I gave you an exercise yesterday, uh, the computation of the trefoil, uh, the Alexander polynomial of the trefoil, and it's here, the answer, and you can verify your answers with this slide. Anyway, so we have uh, discussed that the Alexander polynomial is an invariant of oriented links, and for this, uh, uh, for proving this, we need to verify that the definition of the polynomial is invariant under the choices that we are doing and also the Rydomeister rules, right? Okay, so I'm just skipping this part because we really discussed, but the main point here is to see, I mean, one of the main points was to see, to uh, 
uh, transfer the idea to state some description uh, was the determinant of a square matrix is defined in this way, right? As we all know. So there is this sign uh, of permutations part and some, uh, pro some terms that are coming from the products uh, of matrix entries, whatever matrix we are working with. So the idea for the state sum was to transfer this uh, determinant description to diagrams, right? I mean, we have this uh, matrix description for the Alexander matrix and uh, from, I mean, algebraic description, I would say. But then we want to just read uh, the Alexander matrix off from a given oriented knot diagram. Um, we don't want to deal with the determinant anymore. So the idea was to uh, find out uh, that non-zero terms uh, in the determinant expansion of the matrix that we have can be represented by a, a state uh, for, that is defined for the given diagram. A state was uh, a union of state markers and state markers are uh, uh, placed on regions uh, and um, in a neighboring crossing, right? So here is a state, for example, corresponding to this uh, determinant uh, term that is coming from the multiplication of the chosen uh, entries here. It's a non-zero uh, determinant term and it corresponds to this state uh, on the right. And here, uh, each determinant term is induced by a permutation uh, by the definition of the determinant. And here, what permutation we have, uh, let's see. So if I consider regions as one, two, three also, one chooses one, uh, two chooses three, and uh, three chooses two here. So this determinant term is induced by uh, two, three cycle, right? Uh, the two cycle permutation. So um, I just want to explain what's going on uh, here for the determinant through the diagrams, as I say many times. But uh, there is some missing information, right? I mean, uh, if I go back, it is just, OK, I just uh, present here or represent here the permutation or the bijections from regions to crossings in the diagram. But uh, there was this sign contribution uh, in the determinant expansion. Uh, sign, I mean, we also consider the signs of the permutations that we sum up, right? So here, uh, the idea for the diagram uh, was to define the sign of a state with, the, uh, with some black hole counting, right? So sign of a state is equal to minus two, minus one to the number of black uh, holes. And the black hole was a state marker that lies on the side of a, a crossing uh, where the arrows on the strands are going into the crossing, right? So we just count the black holes in a given state and we find the sign of that state. And then I can define um, a state sum polynomial with the sign uh, computation and the uh, weights for a state that are given as products of uh, weights that I have in the crossings that the state markers are indicating in a given state, right? So, and then finally, we have shown yesterday that this polynomial is actually the Alexander polynomial because uh, we have the clock theorem that uh, gives us that the signs of states are actually the signs of the permutations uh, corresponding or that can be described by that state, right? So this can be proven and uh, this observation that this two sign concept concepts, uh, the sign of a state and sign of a permutation, uh, that they correspond, uh, it is based on the clock theorem that says any two states, any two clock states of a given uh, knot diagram or a link diagram, which is oriented, are related to each other by a sequence of clock moves. Okay? So you remember yesterday we made a, a full picture uh, that contains the states of a figure eight knot with the orientation on it. And uh, we also uh, observed that there are exactly two states, like two extreme states, that admit one of them was just admitting clockwise directed clock moves, and the other, the last one, was uh, admitting just counterclockwise directed clock moves. So this is also uh, included in the, sta uh, in the statement of this theorem that there, it is always the case, not just for figure eight, 
any given oriented uh, link diagram, we will always have two uh, extreme states, um, including or uh, containing this information, uh, or admitting just only clockwise or counterclockwise directed clock moves. So the states are forming uh, a lattice, uh, so we can consider uh, the collection of all states or the set of all states of a given diagram uh, with a partial ordering, right? I mean, uh, clock moves are giving us a partial ordering on this uh, set of states. So we also made an observation, maybe I should go back here, yesterday, that a clock move alternates the sign of a state, right? So here we see on the left a state as and the configuration of the, the placement of the state markers are like this. And uh, then after a clock move, which is in the direction of the clock, we obtain another state as prime. And you can see that in the first picture, we have just one uh, black hole in this local picture. And, and in the next one, after the move, we lose it, right? So uh, every clock move alternates the sign of the, uh, sign of the state. And it, it makes us, uh, or uh, it provides us to pass uh, to another state. So every uh, two states, every two states are related to each other by a sequence of clock moves. And this was the essence of uh, the transition between the determinant description of the Alexander polynomial and the state sum, polyno uh, state -sum polynomial, state sum description. Uh, actually, if you consider, for example, the first state as the identity permutation, you can always enumerate the regions and the uh, crossings of this diagram so that it will correspond to uh, the identity uh, permutation. And I hope there is just, you know, one black hole or zero black hole so that the sign of the state is one. I didn't write it, but you can check. So you can always... Uh, choose your enumeration of the regions and the vertices so that uh, the sign of that state that you have uh, is equal to one and it corresponds to the identity permutation. So suppose that we are starting with the identity permutation here and I'm hoping that the uh, sign of the state is one, then uh, the, signs, uh, the sign is getting uh, to be alternated, right? I mean, in the second, in the latter uh, state, we will observe uh, that the uh, sign of the state will be minus one and then one, minus one and one. So uh, as the permutation signs alternate in the determinant expansion, uh, the signs of the states are also alternating in this way. So clock moves can be considered as transpositions uh, of states, right? I mean, transpositions of permutations can be described in this way or uh, state transpositions can be described as permutation uh, transpositions. So this was the essence of uh, the transition between the Alexander polynomial and the state sum uh, polynomial, so that when we describe polynomial in this way with the signs of states and the product of weights in a given state and we sum all over uh, states, uh, we find the Alexander polynomial. Okay, so this was a summary of uh, yesterday's lecture and uh, here are some properties of the Alexander polynomial that are uh, essential. So the unknot has value one. Of course here, uh, sorry, it's not equality, just keep it in mind. It's up to uh, the multiplication with minus plus uh, x to the sum integer power, uh, x to the sum integer degree. and uh, Secondly, and very importantly, we have this local relation in between three Alexander polynomials of uh, these three links related to each other uh, in a very close way, but in a very dramatic way at the same time. So here on the left hand side, we see a positive crossing. So we consider here an oriented link that contains only positive crossing here in this picture. Then we can uh, turn it to a negative crossing by changing the combinatorics of the diagram and we obtain another uh, link. We may obtain another possibly uh, 
equivalent uh, link diagram here. And finally, we resolve the crossing there, right, to obtain this uh, link diagram, the final. So the Alexander polynomials of these three links are related to each other by this uh, identity, by this relation. Okay. So uh, this was observed by Conway in the 60s. Uh, you can find his uh, paper online. I think it's open access. And um, Alexander uh, Conway described this uh, relation and he said that whatever polynomial uh, satisfying these properties, these two properties, is the Alexander polynomial actually. So it is not really easy to see with the determinant description that the Alexander polynomial satisfies this uh, local relation. Actually, in Alexander's paper, um, this local relation was also discussed, but it wasn't shown explicitly that the polynomial satisfies this uh, relation. Conway also uh, didn't show it, actually. I mean, it was straightforward for him. Uh, but with, by using the state sum description, it, is, uh, it gets easier to show that uh, the state sum polynomial really satisfies this local relation uh, among these three polynomials. So polynomials of these three links. OK, so the, uh, I mean, another important uh, property of the Alexander polynomial is that it's symmetric with respect to x to, uh, I mean, with respect to uh, these variables. So uh, it doesn't detect the mirror symmetry because of this. So it's a symmetric polynomial. So uh, here there's a, a note, a small note here, that uh, in Conway's paper, Alexander polynomial was normalized so that the unknot has value just one. So it's an honest uh, polynomial that Conway was discussing in his paper. It is not just up to some equality or up to some multiplicative term. It is really like uh, his polynomial was saying the unknot gets trivial value. And also the scaling relation uh, is modified a bit uh, in some variable z. Here, instead of uh, this coefficient here, we have z for the third term in the identity. All right. So now uh, we may ask many questions, of course. I mean, this was the historical part. I mean, this was what was uh, done uh, till 80s, right? State some description. OK. Uh, Alexander polynomial was given in 20s and then in the 60s Conway described it with this local uh, scaling relation and then uh, in 80s Kaufman in his book Formal Not Theory discussed the state sum description of the Alexander polynomial. Now uh, first thing that we can ask is can we get rid of the signs of states in the state sum? I mean is there a way to assign local weights at crossing so that we don't need to count uh, the black holes and uh, we don't need to include the sign calculation inside the closed formula for the state sum polynomial. And um, secondly, we may ask what happens if we don't uh, choose the start regions that as adjacent regions. So I mean, up to now, we just say that if you just delete two adjacent regions, uh, your polynomial is under uh, control, let's say, up to some factor, multiplicative factor. But what happens if we do not uh, delete adjacent regions, but some uh, another pair of regions that are not adjacent, possibly? And we can also ask if we can extend this uh, state sum polynomial we described for classical nuts and links for nutoids or nuts in surfaces. So let's have a look what we have done for these questions. So first of all, we can change the local weight system at crossings, all right, in this way. So here what we see is a positive crossing and a negative crossing. And I just do not use here the Alexander's weight system, but I say that this upper part of the crossing is labeled or weighted uh, uh, with one and then minus S inverse one S. And negative in the negative crossing, S and minus S inverse uh, are changing their roles, right? I mean, they're in, uh, exchanging the regions. And up and down regions are uh, signed or weighted by one still. So when you uh, write a polynomial, a state sum polynomial, by using this local weight system, you still get an invariant. Uh, you can show that uh, it will be invariant under oriented right moves. 
And we can also see that the signs of states are absorbed uh, by these minus negative signs here that are added in front of the weights lying in the black hole regions, right? So the black hole regions for these two crossings lying on the left hand side of the crossing. So I just add these minus ones here, uh, negative signs for the weights of black hole regions. So in the end, we can define a state sum polynomial uh, that is just the summation over all states, over all possible clock states. And what we sum is the product of weights given by uh, state markers. Okay, so I can describe such a polynomial. That's cool, but uh, we need to show that this is uh, really uh, the, I mean, determining the Alexander polynomial, right? Uh, for showing this, uh, we can show that it's an easy check actually that the state sum polynomial uh, gets trivial value for the unknot and it satisfies the scaling relation of the Conway Alexander polynomial. Okay, so I just uh, need to make some variable change here because I defined my weight system in S, but uh, when I change this S minus S inverse coefficient here, I mean, I, if I assume Z is equal to this, uh, coefficient here, I obtain the Conway Alexander polynomial, so the Alexander polynomial. So you can find uh, the verifications that this state sum polynomial is an invariant and also that it satisfies these properties in our mock Alexander polynomials paper by Louis Kaufman uh, that is pretty new in archive. All right, so now uh, I described you the state sum description for some polynomials. Eventually, uh, we we were uh, I mean we got rid of the sign calculation as well by assigning some different type of local weight system at crossings, and then uh, we can show that the state sum polynomial, the Alexander Conway polynomial, is actually the uh, permanent of the reduced Alexander matrix uh, with respect to this uh, local weight system. So because, I mean, remember in the determinant expansion we have the contributions, sign contributions coming from the permutations that are describing the determinant uh, expansion, but here uh, with respect to this local weight system we don't need any more uh, the sign calculation here. So we can describe the state sum polynomial as the permanent of the matrix that we can obtain in the same way. It's the region crossing incidence matrix, okay? Uh, whose entries are given uh, with the local weights, corresponding local weights that we assign at crossings. So uh, here is a calculation. Uh, I just obtained this matrix here. Uh, through the trefoil diagram and I calculate the permanent of it and uh, obtain the uh, Conway Alexander polynomial of the trefoil which is 1 plus z square actually. Uh, all right, so this was nice. I mean, uh, it was kind of more straightforward. We got rid of the sign calculations and we have the permanent. Um, of the matrix for the Conway-Alexander polynomial. All right, so what happens in the general picture? So I will give you a recipe now for obtaining Alexander polynomial-like uh, polynomials that we call mock Alexander polynomials. So in the end, what we uh, have in our hand is an oriented uh, and connected knot or link diagram. And by Euler's formula, we say that uh, if there is n crossings or n vertices in the underlying graph, there will be always n plus 2 regions or faces for that graph, right? So we need to eliminate or delete two of the regions. In the classical case, we delete two adjacent regions. But we could delete uh, non-adjacent regions, uh, a pair of non-adjacent regions, and we can still describe states for the resulting start diagram, right? Here are some examples. Uh, in the first case, uh, it's the classical case. We just delete these two adjacent regions. And in the second one, I prefer to delete these two crossing, uh, two regions here. And I will have still a bijection 
which is this state between the regions and the crossings of this diagram, right? There will be three uh, crossings and three regions here. And what happens if we just pass to notoid world? Here is a notoid diagram. And uh, we can easily show by Euler's uh, formula as well. I mean, if you consider this as a planar graph uh, with some number of vertices, you, may sh you can easily show that there will be always n plus one, one more region uh, than the number of crossings in the diagram, in the given diagram. So in this case, one, two, three crossings we have, and this diagram divides the plane into four regions. And I can say that I want to delete the exterior region here so that I can construct or I can obtain a bijection between the regions and the crossings for this diagram, which is giving a state for me for this diagram, right? And when you go uh, to higher genus diagrams, this is a Kishino knot here, which is uh, drawn very nicely, unlike my uh, board pictures. So uh, you can also show by Euler's formula that uh, actually, I can show you the result here. Oops, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, by Euler's formula, we can uh, deduce that uh, the difference between the number of paces and the number of crossings will be equal to 2 minus 2g. So, in the case of a torus, when genus is equal to 1, uh, we have the equality, right? We don't need to start anything. But uh, when we are in genus 2 surface, this will be uh, minus 2, right? So the number of crossings is more than the number of faces uh, in the case for a uh, genus 2 surface uh, knot, right? Uh, like this picture. So in this case, we can propose to delete two crossings a uh, pair of crossings so that you have the equality for the number of faces and for the number of uh, for the number of crossings and regions right uh, and you can describe states and you can assign a weight system to each crossing as we did before and then uh, we can uh, sum up the weights the product of weights that states are describing to us and we take the sum over all uh, states of a given diagram and now we can calculate the permanent of the uh, corresponding um, corresponding uh, matrix, uh, corresponding incidence matrix, right? So there are two ways uh, to obtain the uh, polynomial here, or polynomials that we want to obtain. We can either uh, obtain all states, and we can do some calculation and see uh, the contributions coming from the states and sum them up or we can just uh, transfer the diagram with the weight system on it and with some enumeration, uh, with some ordering on the regions and the crossings to a matrix and we can calculate its permanence, right? So they both give us uh, these two uh, ways or approaches give us some polynomial. If we uh, have a classical knot diagram and if we start two adjacent regions, it will give us the Alexander polynomial, actually, these two uh, ways. All right, so there are some calculations here uh, for the for notoid diagrams in the plane or in the uh, sphere, we can consider them. So here I say that by some uh, basic uh, calculation, we can see that the number of faces in a given notoid diagram will be always more than the number of crossings. So that to obtain a state, we want to delete a crossing, okay? And then we place these local weights at crossings and then I obtain the state sum polynomial here for this notoid diagram. But then we may ask, uh, we may ask what happens if we start another region because there are two more regions here possibly to be start, right? I mean, I could start this middle region here or the innermost region, which is adjacent to the uh, other endpoint here in this picture. So in the classical Alexander polynomial case, uh, we proved that the uh, way that we delete the crossing, uh, delete the regions or uh, the choices that we make to delete or to choose a pair of regions, adjacent regions to be deleted, would result some equivalent uh, polynomials. For notoids, it's not the case. It really matters where you start uh, 
your diagram. So here is a, a start diagram whose exterior region is start and you can extract some polynomial here but it is possibly not the same polynomial that you can obtain when you start some other region here for this diagram. So when you begin to consider start uh, diagrams or deleted region diagrams, you need to consider some new category called uh, start notoids. So in this case, we assume some Rydermeister moves. We assume the classical Rydermeister moves uh, to induce an equivalence relation for start notoids. But we forbid this kind of Rydermeister moves that contains some start uh, region or start crossing. I didn't draw all of them. But here it is forbidden to lose this start region. So stars are acting like punctures in that plane. If you consider the plane as thickened, so it's like a handle body with punctures, right? So you are not allowed to shift or move or pull your strand along the punctures. So when you consider uh, some kind of restricted isotopy relation, which we call star equivalence relation uh, on star diagrams, uh, you have invariance for the state sum polynomial. But with respect to this uh, equivalence relation or isotopy relation, these two diagrams will, will not be the same. Okay? Their polynomials will differ and they are uh, representing different start netoids. Okay. Um, all right, I say that, uh, I mean, through the recipe, we, s we have seen that the state sums uh, can be described uh, as permanence of matrices that we can construct as like uh, incidence matrices. And here uh, we have a picture together with Luke Kaufman and me. Uh, you can see it's, uh, it was taken during my PhD times and we were very interested in notoids and <laughs> we were happy to uh, find an invariant, I guess, at that time. Uh, to distinguish two notoids that we see in the picture. All right, so uh, I just told you that uh, starring the way that we, I mean, the choice that we make for starring regions for a notoid diagram can change the resulting state sum polynomial, right? And here uh, is a diagram whose polynomial is found to be a square plus s minus s inverse. And when I change the start region and I obtain a different start diagram, I find that the state sum polynomial of this uh, diagram is s to the minus 2 plus s minus s inverse, right? So these polynomials are not the same. But there is a symmetry uh, observation here, a symmetry, a beautiful symmetry going on. Uh, actually, these polynomials are uh, related to each other by this variable change, right? I mean, when you uh, calculate the polynomial for the second diagram in minus s inverse, you will find the polynomial given for the first diagram, all right? And this is always the case. So uh, there is kind of, uh, there exists kind of a symmetry between the polynomials of these two uh, objects, start notoids, and uh, we can say that I mean, we can generalize this observation that if you start the exterior region and if you start the interior region of a given notoid diagram, the polynomials will always differ uh, in this way. So uh, this result was proven uh, by uh, Walt Moldmaker and uh, uh, with our discussion with Kaufman, Monaghan and uh, myself. And here is a picture of Walt, Joe and uh, myself here uh, taken uh, last week. Uh, in this very nice, super nice place. Okay, so I just go to the next slide and um, now, I mean, we can ask to ourself, uh, ourselves that we described the state sum polynomial and it was given by a permanent, right? By the permanent of some matrix, right? Uh, so the question is, can we describe the state sum polynomial with a determinant or with a determinant of the matrix, right? Because the clock theorem for the classical case was uh, making us able to uh, describe uh, the state sum polynomial through the determinant, through some determinant, or uh, vice versa, right? A determinant with the state sum. So for the notoids, we have the clock theorem by some extended moves. So 
let me just give this mousse for notoids. So uh, basically what we can have for notoids uh, as an extended case is that if we have a state marker in a region that is uh, a neighbor of an endpoint, right? You can just take this uh, state marker to here. But you see that in the global picture, um, the state marker stays in the same region, right? So we assume the usual block modes for notoids that will just exchange the placement of these two state markers that are neighboring, right? And also, we have this extension for notoid diagrams. I mean, we can swap uh, the state markers in the regions uh, that lie, uh, I mean, that is uh, neighboring the endpoints, but uh, they will remain in the same region. So because of this property, the uh, signs are not alternating uh, uh, under a clock move or under such type of uh, clock moves. So here is a picture for this. We see some directed strands here. So in the uh, former case, we see a white hole here, right? It's not a black hole. The state marker indicates a white hole. And you take it to here, down, and it's still not a, a black hole. So the black hole partitioning or the counting is the same uh, for these two states. So signs are not alternating for notoid diagrams. So we have the clock theorem for notoids that says that any given two states are related to each other by a sequence of clock moves. It still works. And moreover, states of K form a lattice. States of a notoid diagram form a lattice, as in the classical case. But uh, we cannot capture the uh, sign information uh, that will appear in the determined expansion. Right? The signs are not alternating in the lattice of states uh, for a notoid diagram. So um, for now, we have the state sum polynomial as the permanent of some matrix, incidence matrix, I, I call it. Uh, but we cannot describe it with a determinant. So the question uh, is open here. Can we describe the state sum polynomial as the determinant of some matrix? Right? maybe some other metrics. Can we give a determinant uh, description for that, for this polynomial? All right, so here are some examples. Uh, I just say that we can see that if our knot lies, our knot diagram uh, lies in a torus, then we have the equality for the number of faces and for the number of crossings, so that we don't need to delete anything here. We see a, a perfect knot here, a blue uh, knot, uh, lying in the torus, and we can count that there are two crossings and two regions here. So when you just uh, form the incidence matrix here, uh, vertex uh, region uh, incidence matrix, you can just calculate directly the permanent of this matrix, and we find the polynomial for this diagram, which is an invariant in this category. And if we have a linkoid with two components, we still have the equality for the number of faces and for the number of uh, crossings. It, uh, it is also resulting from the earlier uh, formula. We can uh, see that the difference between the number of faces and number of crossings is equal to 2 minus 2g minus m. m is the notoidal components here, which are open components in a given linkoid diagram. And when g is equal to 0, it is just uh, 2 minus m this difference and um, uh, here in this case in this picture is equal to 2 so we have the equality right for so uh, for a given linkoid diagram with two uh, notoidal components uh, we can just directly compute its state sum polynomial or uh, the perm with the permanent uh, of the incidence matrix that we extract out of the diagram we don't need to delete a crossing, neither a crossing or a, a region here. 
All right, so here is a case again uh, that i shown before. It's the Kishino knot. Uh, in this case, since it lies in genus 2 surface, the number of crossings is two more than the number of faces here. And we start these two uh, crossings here. And I just uh, obtain its matrix and I calculate its uh, invariant polynomial. All right, when I... Uh, think some of the uh, crossings as start, of course I need to forbid this kind of rhydomycer moves which deletes or add a start crossing, right? I really think that these are like punctures and there are some filaments of strings attached to these punctures and they are not able to move uh, in our manifold. Okay, so I think this is the end of uh, my talk and thank you very much for participating and everything for your questions that was very good and uh, here are some here is a list of some references actually i started with the uh, paper of alexander and then uh, i have some references to notoid's paper and you know uh, mark alexander polynomials and we are trying to make a generalization for the clock theorem this is still a work in progress and we are writing all together, Walt, Joe, Lou and me are writing a paper all together uh, that will be a continuation of the first Mac Alexander polynomial paper. And um, I can suggest you more references if you just contact me and I will try to uh, send you these lecture notes. And yeah, I mean, if you have questions, I will go to the chat right now and you can ask. Thank you very much.